Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming so early in your day to hear this fascinating panel on new voices, the next generation of digital storytellers. Uh, my name is Jesse Cleverly. I'm the creative director of a uh, scripted IP incubator in the UK called Wild Seed Studios. And um, we're going to have a 45 minute conversation today uh, about uh, the new generation of storytelling, formats, distribution, what's working, what's not. Definitely one of the most interesting panels I've ever been lucky enough to moderate at MIP. Um, and I'm joined on stage uh, by some truly fantastic panellists, all of whom I've had a chance to talk to and all of whom I know have got really interesting insights to share with you today. No pressure, guys. Uh, next to me here is Joanna Wells, who's the Vice President of Digital Content Comedy Central and MTV Viacom International Media Networks winner of the longest job title on the panel. Uh, next to uh, Joanna is Sebastian Burkhart, who is the SVP of Digital and Acquisitions at Keshnet International USA. Uh, next to Sebastian is Marianne furvold Borland. Yeah, Not bad. Um, who's, the, who's an executive producer at NRK in Norway and made a really fantastic and interesting series called Shame that I know she's going to tell us about. And last but not least, on the end, is Arunob Kumar, who's the founder and CEO of Viral Fever in India. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Your mum's here, Aronob, yeah. Um, so, um, we're going to go in alphabetical order for the presentations. Um, so, first of all, Sebastian, could you tell us uh, a little bit about who you are, what you do, and maybe even show us something? Absolutely. Thanks for the, the grand introduction. Um, um, I'm not going to do a massive presentation here. Just quickly, uh, a, a very brief introduction about Keshit and myself. So, I head up the uh, digital content division for Keshit International. Um, which is the global um, content studio of the Keshet, of Keshet Media Group, which is a big Israeli media company um, that also operates a big commercial broadcast in Israel. And um, what we've been known for, um, or what we are known for, is, is being unscripted, inscripted uh, programming that engages um, mainstream audiences. But um, Progressively over the years, we've obviously sh seen a shift in terms of, um, as a, in particular as a broadcaster, where where audiences are going. So if we, we've taken a very early, very proactive um, um, position when it comes to digital first programming, um, which we have been both doing in Israel but also internationally. Um, I myself am based in 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 LA in, in the US and um, am spearheading our efforts in the digital first. Um, um, content space for us. Um, I brought along a short clip just to, as, a, as a flavor of the type of um, digital initiatives that we're doing, um, which is both across digital first, origi original digital series, um, big transmedia formats that have both um, digital kind of narratives at the heart of, of, of these formats. Um, and then also we do a lot of companion shows like to our existing programming, both on the scripted and the unscripted side. And then another element that is very important to us is international distribution. So um, um, as a big content distributor and seeing the shift um, of, of, of where, those, where the audience, audiences are nowadays, um, digital content and premium digital content is, is absolutely key to us. So we work with a number, number of digital content producers to take their content to the international market at the same time. So, so much we could talk about just on that reel. Okay, so next, Marianne, tell us a little bit about Shame. Oh, I'm so excited to talk about Shame, but first I want us to, to watch a little clip. Is yep, uh, this was a recap from season two of Shame, an uh, ordinary uh, teenage drama about 16-year-old girls showing their heartbreak, their partying, their challenges they are facing when they are studying high school. You've seen it all before, haven't you? Yeah? But this ordinary teenage drama is being broadcasted in an unusual way. Because web is our primary platform and SWOT our secondary, and linear television, a kind of a bonus. We publish our content uh, on our website and we publish in real time. And that means that if uh, the characters in the show decides to meet up after a party at 2 a.m. in the morning, we broadcast that at 2 a.m. in the morning. And if it's New Year's Eve in real time in our life, then we publish something on New Year's Eve that is all about New Year's Eve. And we publish something on our site almost every day. Uh, it's uh, chats, text, Instagram pictures or videos. And then the videos are put together to a full episode 
at the end of the week that we publish on NRK's web TV. So our audience can therefore choose whether they want to follow the show from day to day, giving a more sort of a real life experience, or just wait till the full episode airs on Fridays. Uh, and we see this massive interest and enthusiasm among the uh, viewers in our comments. They have actually created their own sort of a shame community. And they share their thoughts and the, on the storyline and they discuss with each other. And I must say that this is just a great way to evaluate our content immediately after that we have broadcasted it. Mm. Yes, all the uh, main characters have their own uh, profiles on social media platforms uh, like Instagram and others. And here we post chats uh, and videos that are uh, uh, in the storyline, but also things that an ordinary teenager would do. And we can also see that the audience are uh, participating with the characters, which is a bit sort of uh, great, but also a bit scary because, I mean, it's not real people. I think that last time I checked, yeah, you can see uh, uh, Nora, she has more than 77,000 followers, and she's a real person, but it's great. So, as you can see, social media is fully integrated in the storyline. Okay, okay. Yeah, technology. Technology, yes! But to be able to create a show that uh, makes identification and a good story, you have to know your audience and you have to do your research. So uh, we were allowed to have more than four months uh, research period. And we uh, went to youth clubs, to schools. Uh, we spent hours on end at Instagram and Snapchat. And I must say that social media is a great way to get to know your audience. And uh, especially for the kids to know their language, their form, their way of communicating to each other and their humor. And we also did more than 50 in-depth interviews. Uh, we have chosen a pretty, uh, pretty unorthodox PR strategy. No promotion whatsoever. No build-up of expectations and no big campaign around the premiere. Uh, we did not want the parents to sort of come home to their kids and say, wow, NRK has made this great show about teenagers for you. I have a 16-year-old girl at home. She doesn't want me to tell her what to watch. So we wanted the kids to discover it themselves. So uh, before season one, we uh, made a short uh, uh, promo that we um, sent to the, some of the uh, kids that had auditions for the shows and also the actors. And then they distributed it for us. They did the promo for us. It was a strict rumor-based strategy. And I believe that uh, uh, this is a part of the success because it creates a loyalty and a feeling of unity and an ownership to the show among the target group. So, during the first week of season one, we had uh, 25,682 unique users. By the end of season two, we had uh, over 1.2 million unique vis visitors weekly. And I mean, nowhere has a population of five millions. And the first day of season three, we had uh, more than 560,000 unique users. And uh, I must say for reference, in Norway, it's about roughly 60,000 16 year olds. So yeah, we have, uh, uh, there's a resonance there in the audience in Norway. Yep, so what has this taught us? Go digital with uh, social media fully integrated. Know your audience, do your research, but maybe most of all, have a good and authentic storytelling. Thank you, that's shame for you. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we will be talking more about this. Arinob, tell us all about um, what you're up to at Viral Fever. Uh, yeah, so I still get invited to medical conferences on Zika sometimes. So, yeah, we started the viral fever four years back, and uh, uh, we belong to what happens to be called in India as the lowest caste system of storytellers. I mean, who wants to create stories on digital? It doesn't really make sense. And uh, we started in February 2012. So I think uh, 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 so, so, uh, should we play the AV before or? Yeah. So can we? Uh, so I will just like you to see 100 seconds of what happened in our dark ages and crusades. So can we have the AV, please? 
so yes, uh, we are the viral fever. Uh, we started four years back. Uh, yes. Uh, so uh, I used to do this small research in India. I used to go with my phone and ask all my youngsters, friends, and uh, college students that, what is your last television memory? This was in 2010. And the only answer that we used to get was match and news. And so an entire generation of below 34 in India had stopped watching fiction. I mean, that's another thing that some of the best fiction happens to be on news today. So, uh, so they were doing the right thing. Uh, but uh, we realized that while they had stopped watching Indian fiction, they were watching a lot of short formats. They were watching Seinfeld, Friends, and How I Met Your Mother. So they did have a penchant for watching anything which was appealed to them. Three things happened in 2011. Uh, sorry, Joanna. But uh, all the so-called youth Indian TV channels rejected some of the shows that we wanted to make. I wanted to make How I Met Your Mother of India. I wanted to make Big Bang Theory of India. Yes, inspiration. The second thing was YouTube and online video technology became smoother. And the third thing, which was the most important, and I always have immense gratitude for them, which is Canon. Video production became easy and inexpensive. The three most important ingredients for any content company, production, distribution, and, and, this is exactly what you need. And the mystery third, frustration. frustration. <laughs> so that was a visual representation of what actually is the third most important ingredient for. <laughs> so yes, uh, when these three things were combined, we realized that, okay, we want to make our kind of shows. We want to tell our kind of stories. So let's just start envisaging what was a very foolish ambition to make our own MTV online. And that seemed possible. Well, okay. <laughs> so yeah, uh, this is a content conference. So technology is just short charging us like the big four companies and everyone else, I'm sure you know. So bragging time, uh, we were the first, first to make original content go viral in the country. We were the first to have a million subs, which seems dwarf now. But I think what was most interesting and what is relevant to the panel discussion today was that uh, we are the only network which manages to make a six second video go viral as well as a 60 minute go video viral. So we have had long form web series launched on YouTube and two of our series, Permanent Roommates, happens to be actually the second most watched long form web series on the entire global YouTube ecosystem. It's 50 minutes per episode. And this is something which we never expected to have happened, but I think it was just because we were trying to be honest and tell the stories. And... Uh, uh, <coughs> So uh, when I was in college, always wanted an Indian show to be there in top tip uh, IMDb. And we made, up, we made a show called Pictures, which is ranked 35th in the world, above Seinfeld, Friends, and Narcos, which is the best thing that we've ever done. And I think we're out of time. So, And we have ended up becoming bigger than most of the Indian television networks for youth in a span of four years using digital as a storytelling medium. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. If you could pass the clicker down here, yeah, please. I hope that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. So last but not least, Joanna, tell us all. Um, so what I'm here today to talk about really is how we are using short form to linear and how we're using our digital platforms to really grow and experiment with our short form. Um, if I can get this to work, it's not working. Okay, so I think one of the most important things of why it's working is as a brand builder, we're able to put short form series on the map um, and we're basically able to attract different kind of talent than we would for a linear show. So we're able to experiment a lot more um, and we're able to sort of develop talent we probably wouldn't normally take a risk on. We wouldn't normally kind of think, okay, we'll, we'll see what this kind of how this narrative is going to work out, how this authorship is going to work out, especially in comedy and things like that, where you kind of, you want a show to be successful, you want to know that you've got a big name and someone who's really going to draw people to that show. Um, so Comedy Central US has been really, really um, great in kind of working with people like James Davis, this kind of Swagasaurus series that he created. 
um, on Snapchat, which has now been turned into, in, in a different kind of form, um, a linear series. And also I think what's really important for sort of MTV and for Comedy Central is to be at the forefront again of like really innovative digital content. We're lucky enough, I'm lucky enough to run uh, Snapchat Discover channels for Comedy Central and MTV, which means we have this great platform where we're able to basically create original short form series for those platforms. We have invested a lot of time and energy um, in kind of creating really innovative pieces of content with up and coming talent. Um, and it's really a great way for us to be able to get really high views and look at revenue potential. It's a great place for us to be able to sort of pilot content. We get feedback in real time. We know what people are liking. We know when they're liking it. We know what works best on the different platforms. And we're really able to experiment with the amount of time we spend on different platforms creating bespoke pieces of content for each one. Um, I will give you an idea of kind of how we do this. Um, we basically have been working with a number of different production companies. Um, we've also been working, I've been saying to interns, here's some money, go off and make something. I think that's what's great about this is the democracy of it, where you're able to basically say to anybody with a small piece of investment, go away and see if this works and if this resonates with this audience. And then we're able to really scale quickly on the successes on our multi-platforms and able to share all of our learnings across all of international. Um, I will show you <laughs> some of the things. You're obviously aware of Idiot Sitters was something that started on Comedy Central as a um, Snapchat series. It's now got its own linear series. Swagasaurus I've talked about. Obviously, Broad City was a YouTube series that is now hugely successful on comedy. And in international, we develop a W2F news section, which is weird and wonderful things happening around the world, which we're turning into a linear. <laughs> That's a five-hour show daily at the <laughs> it moment. It really is. So that's just a little taster of what we do on, com on comedy. And now I'll show you a bit about the short form that we've been creating on MTV. Oh. Oh. Maybe, you Maybe I won't. Hmm. Oh, well. I wonder what's going on there. I think that might okay. be the fin du présentation, <laughs> Oh, hang on. Is there more? I don't know. No. It's so short. <laughs> it's the so content. short. It's gone. <laughs> you, that was there. It's fantastic. Over in a second. <laughs> Can you tell us? Recreate it in words. I think for MTV, you know, that audience expects you to be ahead of the curve. We've created a number of different formats. We've created some game shows with some of our MTV talent. Uh, show us your phone. What's really important about creating short form original content for, especially for Snapchat, is it has to inhabit the world of Snapchat. So everything we talk about happens to you know that key demographic we have to be ahead of the curve I think talking about authenticity and originality and not faking things is absolutely key if we look like we're over commercializing something or we're trying to be you know telling the kids what to think then they'll automatically switch off so I think the difference with MTV is that you I mean I'm lucky that I've got a bunch of really talented 18 year olds creating content for themselves and I think it's really important to have that authenticity when you're creating content for that comedy is different and harder because you've got to be funny um, but I think that authenticity and that ability to kind of everything happens in real time we're creating 12 pieces of content a day that lasts for 24 hours a day you're investing all that time and energy into a short form series that's there and gone um, and then it's like how do you extend the life of, of that content um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yes. yes, there's a key takeaway. It's a lot of work. Um, okay, thank you very, very much indeed. So, uh, and what, 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 what was? No, the... I'm, I'm just so totally agree with you. And uh, which uh, we um, uh, see uh, with shame because we are the scripts are written about one or two weeks before we actually are filming it, and then we are out in two weeks. Uh, we are now, uh, we can be able to be, um, take in what is actually happening in the youth society and by that they feel that we take them seriously. And I think that is the, is the key for, for making that relationship to, to uh, such a young audience. Mm, okay, thank you. So let's just um, start by talking about talent and talent development because obviously all of, as you've you know, as we've been saying, this is all driven by, you know, often young creators with ideas uh, that resonate with the audience or don't. So, um, just l let me start um, with you, Joanna. Um, just, just 
could you just paint a picture of how you think that what you do either has shifted or is shifting the sort of attitude towards talent development? I mean, where are you looking for talent and, and what, what is it you look for? Uh, I think we look for talent everywhere now. I don't think we're sort of like, oh, is it a big name? Is it somebody that everyone will know? Mm. Because the amount of money that you're investing isn't, isn't so huge. People are prepared to sort of go on a journey with talent. And I think we are able to work with a lot more people. For example, what you might spend marketing on linear TV show, we could sort of make 10 short film yeah. series with. Yeah. So I think then you're able to sort of, there's not such a pressure on that talent. And I think authorship is really, really important, that yeah. authentic voice. So ensuring that our talent is able to have their voice, to grow their voice, for us to help develop that voice with them is absolutely key. And I think you get so much more from talent as well mm. if you're, engaging with them in the process from from the beginning mm. and sort of growing with them and you know we're just starting out on our journey i don't think we're you know i think we've got so much you know many places to go that i think this is just the beginning and do you think do you think that the audience the gen z audience care as much as previous audiences about you know the idea of a name is it just that their idea of where the, of where they source their celebrities is changing or do you think they are less interested in I can tell you that Kylie Jenner is the biggest thing on Snapchat and she will continue to be yeah. for a while. Yeah. So I think, no, I think it's, it's, I mean, I have a rule. If you're over 25, you can't appear on the front of our Snapchat in any shape or form because oh, well, they I'm just won't click on you. They I'm just, okay for another yeah, six months. Be yeah. good. Mm. Um, I think, <laughs> I, and I was really shocked to call it the Ryan Gosling effect. Remember when we first launched Snapchat, mm. I put this whole Ryan Gosling thing thinking it would do really, really well. It absolutely tanked and everyone yeah. said, no one knows who he is or cares. Yeah. Said, oh, okay. Isn't he Here's someone's, a isn't he someone's dad? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, and, and so with, for you, Sebastian, I mean, obviously you're looking both for CashNet but you're also looking at projects that CashNet could take into international distribution. And in terms of the just Staying with a talent question, you know, wh wh what's your feeling about that? That at the importance of that to you, and and if someone walks in with a million subs on YouTube, for example, does that move the dial for you, or are you what 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 are the metrics you're applying? I mean, obviously, other than talent itself, I suppose. Um, I think like it's it's a, it's a it, yes and no. I think there's a whole um, generation of new storytellers out there and um, that are kind of breaking a bit like the traditional ecosystem of, of, of how you go about like creating content. Um, and you obviously want to work with them in, 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 in different capacities. Uh, if you work with a big YouTube star that brings 8 million um, subscribers and you can, can create a show around those, th that talent, that's obviously a very, very interesting proposition when you take that to the market, to a platform and say, okay, we have a built-in audience here. Um, and just to picking up on that, internationally speaking, are you finding that that talent is more international now because it's available internationally? Because like, you know, the old story, wasn't it, where you'd walk around LA with a piece of, well, in my case, British talent, you know, and every cab journey was like, no, 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 really, they have heard, no, 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 I know that they haven't seen your show, but, the, you know, and it was just all deeply embarrassing because there's a sort of real asymmetry often between, you know, their fame where you had brought them from and their profile in LA. Is that changing now, do you think, talent's becoming more international? Absolutely, I think uh, obviously there are, there's massive U.S. talent that it just by by numbers it just happens to be bigger, to be bigger than sometimes a British star or French or Norwegian or, or whatever. Um, but at the same time, it 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 doesn't it doesn't always really matter, you know how how um, how, how how big they are. We see a lot of talent uh, um, coming over from from the U.K. and and doing quite well in the U.S. right now. Um, but at the same time, it's not just about uh, about uh, digital storytellers, really. I mean, there's a lot of good traditional co um, storytellers that want to do things in digital, and that's also very exciting. Because I think. of the freedom that they get. Absolutely, yeah. and it's also um, the very notion of digital is also to be, it's, it's being challenged right now. What does it actually mean to be di like? Uh, what is digital content? Because I think. There's, there's, the lines are really blurring mm. between what is traditional content, what is digital con mm. content. Yes, there are sometimes differences in terms of obviously platform, yeah. um, but also form and duration. But I think in general, um, what we're seeing right now is, is those two worlds really merging and it's all about talent. You see traditional talent doing digital things, digital talent doing, wanting to do traditional TV. So we have those two movements really do those two kind of streams um, happening at, at, at the moment, I would and, say. And, and I don't know, but I mean, I'm less 
conscious just because it's kind of less in my kind of daily feed you know how you know how you fit in and and where you, you know what you arrived into but you know that stat that you've got on your presentation about having sort of overtaken you know the incumbent players within four years do you, to what extent do you think that was because you understood that the audience wants a new generation of talent or you know how was ta how did talent play a role do you think in the success that you've created i uh, see i think uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the ways that we started actually so we started our uh, digital studio so we were creators ourselves yeah. and actually we wanted to create tv shows and that's why we went to the tv channels yeah. but i think it was not from the desire okay we are going to tap into digital we are going to be uh, we didn't have a sort of a vision that okay half a decade later this is going to be big I think it was accidental because every format rejected us. So we were rejected by film studios, we were rejected by television. And then we said, okay, boy, if we still have to do it, we'll just do it wherever we are allowed to do it. I, I mean, I love that every massive success was hugely rejected. So I think if you're rejected a lot, you're onto something, right? Uh, well, I think, yeah, that's, that's got to be the best rejection <laughs> of our lives. But I think yeah. talent, so we started as a team of three people. Yeah. Uh, I used to direct, there was a writer and there was an editor. And we started making small, small sketches. In fact, the first show that we made was actually a spoof of one of the biggest television shows in the country. And that actually ended up getting almost a million views in less than three days. And that's when we realized that, so uh, speaking of ways, digital, if nothing, gives you the best pilot test that you can ever do. Yeah, absolutely. And I saw in Joanna's this thing, and this is what exactly, if you make a show, you put it out there, the views, the traction, the likes, and the comments are the most purest form of A-B testing that you can so, so do you think that, because we, we pilot rather than scripts, yeah. that's mm -hmm. what we do, and we, you know, manage to make like you in terms of, you know, you see the Canon logo, and you're like, yes, thank you, Canon, for making our lives possible. Do you think that piloting is, you know, replace, no one's going to want to say this, right, but, you know, is piloting now sort of almost a better strategy than developing, you know, your show bible, your scripts, your, you know, the, 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 the sort of that urge for, 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 for perfection that you get in TV uh, development? Is it I, better, do you think, to just roll out with a pilot and go, okay, let's just try it and see what I, happens? I wouldn't completely agree with it. I think there's method and madness and which we got to balance. So uh, there are times when there is only so much of data and traction that you can rely on. Mm -hmm. So uh, while everyone throws out this uh, example of Netflix, from data making house of cards. But they do never talk about the biggest failure that was Marco Polo, which was also a result of a data. So I think if you take out the human element, I think stories are nothing but data with a soul. And you got to put that soul. So I think there is still a lot of intangible element in content which is left. And that's why we have our jobs. So oh, Stories of data with a soul, isn't that cool? I'm having that. My next <laughs> meeting, I'm just going to say that like I made it up. Yeah. Um, so. Marianne, let's talk about formats. Let's just let's move on. Obviously, we could talk, I could talk, we could talk about talent all day, but let's let's move on because we, time is short. So you've created this truly transmedia format, and 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 it seems to me a huge part of your success has been, you know, that innovation around the show existing across multiple platforms in real time. Just, and as a producer, what do you th what, what what's been the big experience there in terms of all the big learning in terms of format for you in looking forward i guess i must say that in nrk we have been uh, producing shows like this uh, web series for the last uh, since 2009 uh, in 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 different scales um uh, but i think that we have evolved together with the audience and with, together with uh, the platforms and the uh, the, the different places where we can see stories but i think that uh, we shall not be afraid of trying new formats uh, and uh, uh, being willing to um, to to, to uh, fail, and then being willing not only to to look at the numbers, and that's uh, coming from a public broadcaster. We are uh, lucky enough to, you know, we can be a niche. We can say we're going for the 16-year-old girls, and we are getting time to research and do that. But I think that we should almost always try to explore and and find the audience where they actually are. And we see now that uh, I think it's about 80% of uh, our target audience are watching the show on mobiles. And we shall take that seriously. Yeah. Uh, but again, we need to have a good story. Yeah. Because they don't care where they watch it if they don't uh, relate to the storyline or they feel that they can and Do you think them. that carrot, you know, is obviously the, the endless debate about plot versus character, right? You know, is it plot or is it character? You know, do you think that the audience turn up 
but because you know back, back you know when we were doing this stuff at the BBC a lot of what we did was like oh, it's going to be a detective story and then right, the audience are going to hunt through a hundred websites to find the truth and then we're going to have the website of the shady corporation but they're not going to you know so there was a lot of sort of detective work and then I, it seemed to us actually what people were really interested in was characters that they loved and, and that sort of thought of they're going to be totally fascinated mm. by your story and follow it mm. didn't pan out as much as if they love a character they'll follow them you know and i think that's essential uh you need to find uh, a need in the audience that they don't need now know that they need yes. and for example one of the characters in the show asana is a young muslim girl and she was created after we had an interview with a young muslim girl at a school 17 year old girl which said that i don't see a strong cool smart Muslim girl on television or in in in, in, uh, in films that can give me some tools mm. to become uh, um, an independent and strong Muslim girl in my in my religion and in myself. And we were like, okay, yeah, there's a need in the audience. We need to create a kind of character uh, that she needs that can help her. Mm. And uh, I must say that Sana, she has become a, like a an icon for young Muslim girls in Norway now, and I'm really proud, I get very moved about talking about this, because this is all about uh, our, our mission, that we need to create tools for the audience to, to help them in their lives by doing this kind of things, even if it's shorts or big drama. Mm. Yes, and I mean, obviously you've done that thing, haven't you, with lots of short episodes and then compiled for television, so, you know, different platforms, supporting different content links but you know I was really interested with what you said Aaron about it's 50 minute episodes on yeah. was that were they on YouTube those yeah, episodes yeah, YouTube, so, so the platform where no one watches more than X two minutes of content they're all sitting down for 50 minutes I think I think uh, when we also started so we started making 10 minute videos then we did a small series which was 20 minutes an yeah. episode and that was all on YouTube and then we saw 70% watch time retention which is almost 14 minutes mm. per video that gave us the confidence that, okay, we should try something which is 30 minutes per episode. Yeah. So we made a small show called Permanent Roommates, which is about a couple uh, about to get married and become permanent roommates in their lives. And uh, we thought families are permanent roommates, so we hoped that families would watch it. And yes, in second season, first season was 30 minute episode, second season is 55 minutes per episode. And it's been watched by over 6 million people per episode. And, and, so. and, and for you, uh, Joanna, you start lots of things short, yeah. at, which is presumably a sort of cost and speed and risk calculation as much as anything, is it? Yeah, or? I think also because we have such a huge audience on Snapchat that we're able to get it out to as many yeah. people really quickly. And then we will scale. So we use Facebook. And we're actually looking to do stuff on Facebook Live and create kind of comedy yes. shorts that go out live on Facebook. Yeah. And then we're also a lot of stuff on YouTube. So we playlist a lot of things. So yes. we'll create something that we'll, could we sit there and see that someone's watched 20 minutes of something. And then I think for us around our actual linear TV shows, we create a lot of digital extras and other additional storylines. So people go to those platforms to sort of immerse themselves more. But yeah, the, the platform is really important about the time and the length duration. And I think about what you're saying about mobile is so important because 80%, if not more, of MTV's audience watch everything on their mobile. So we are mobile first and pretty much all of the digital content that we create and all of our storytelling because we know that if it's not in the right format, it's not easy to look at. We subtitle pretty much everything as well because we know that you not, might not have the sound on. Um, so we're very conscious. And we also shoot things with three cameras. So we'll shoot for Snapchat and then we'll shoot for YouTube at the same time. So we're kind of mastering ways in which <laughs> it's seven, not easy. There are 700 cameras. And then there's like yeah. 75 what, edits. Well, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. And Sebastian, you know, the, the, I mean, it's interesting hearing everyone who says, you know, we started at two minutes, then we got to four minutes, and now we're at 50. You know, so it's sort of like, is longer, is everyone heading longer? Is longer the sign that it's working? Or when, you know, when you're, both developing your own ideas and also thinking about well, what can I sell out there? What are you What are you seeing in format? What 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 worries you and what What excites you? Um, I think I would also we've been experienced a lot with short form and um, over over the, over the past few years, and then it just happened that we had a lot of good kind of concept that we that we incubated and that were just really good storytelling. And then, then from various kind of different bias, we always go ask, can you make that, is it just the traditional half hour? And that includes also just kind of new OTT places. And, um, 
And I think for us right now, most of our developments, especially in the scripted space, mm. when it comes to digital first, kind of like scripted shows, tends to be a lot of them traditional half hours right now, funnily enough, that we, that we just start in terms of storytelling, we start with traditional half hours and, and, and look at how that works just as a good narrative story. Mm. And then a lot of times then we reshape those if it's a mobile OTT platform that says, all right, we, we, that actually only works for us as 10 to 11 minute episodes, then we usually cut that down. But I think generally speaking, in particular in the US, there is a, for, there is a move towards, in particular when it comes to scripted, to longer form iterations of, of, of digital content and, and, and away from, from kind of like the shorter... Um, and, and is that just because people have... I mean, it's interesting, isn't it, in digital? You go, okay, all, all the rules have been ripped up and then you end up with a structure that looks pretty similar to what you were doing before because you're like, oh, yeah, that's because it works. So do you think that that move towards longer form content is because actually it just, it just turns out that as a story unit is a really good story unit? Or do you think that's a kind of business a decision driven by business because you know that 22 minutes will sell to commercial television and I mean I I think that's a what you describe in the second scenario what like kind of like the or commercial opportunity yeah. is here is, is more the it's, it's an opportunity opportunistic way of looking at it, but I, I think what what you guys said earlier that at the end of the day it's all about the characters and seeing what kind of strong story that you can come up with mm -hmm. and uh, that doesn't mean it's a 22, it could be a 40 minute episode, it could be a 50 minute episode. It's, there's a lot of digital features that are doing exceptionally well on, 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 on YouTubes and other OTT places. So I don't think it's, it's short form is not the norm anymore in, in, in the digital, pace, digital space, that's for sure. Uh, but it also doesn't mean that we are just reverting back to traditional forms of what we used to on linear TV. Mm. It's just sometimes it ends up being longer, sometimes it's shorter, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. But I think just in general, you need a bit of time to tell a good story. I think that's just the nature of this, yeah, right. of, of, of this business. And then to your second point, yes, um, for a lot of content producers, there is, in, in the digital space, there is an opportunity to also look what the long tail value of of the content is that, that, that you're making. So if you've been making a really good um, digital first series on a, on, on a US uh, OTT platform that's going after a millennial audience, you can also see, okay, how can we repackage that like for as a secondary window in, in, in the US market or potentially take it internationally? Um, so we're working with a number of partners that have been producing exceptional um, mid-form, like kind of 11-minute episodes, um, uh, scripted series. We repackage those, take those to the international market, and they can find both a home on OTT, but also on traditional linear um, TV channels if there's enough volume kind of to be exploited. And um, just um, the relationship between kind of premium platforms, I mean, I say these, you know, these are all such sort of fluid terms, but, you know, AdVod platforms like YouTube, you know, which are obviously free to consume, in most cases, lower return to the producer probably than a sale to a premium platform like a Netflix or an Amazon. I mean, I'd be interested in hearing, you know, your thoughts, and all of your thoughts really on what, what is the emerging relationship, do we think, between those free platforms like YouTube where anybody can upload anything and there's sort of those terrifying stats about seven days of content going on every day or, you know, there's a spiraling inventory and then these more curated platforms. What, what do we think, you know, I'll start with, with you, if I may, Joanna, on this one. Uh, because obviously you publish on a lot of, you know, free platforms, as it were, and yeah. yet you yourselves are a premium platform. So what, what do you see as the sort of evolving relationship between those free social media spaces and those curated premium spaces? I think, I think for us, the, you know, the volume that you get on the free and the amount of sort of data you can get from that is really key for me in terms of piloting and research and looking at the stat, I mean, I'm digital through and through, yeah. so I love a stat. Yes. And I love to see who's doing what, when and where, and, and getting that immediate mm. response. Which has also been powerful for you, Marianne, right, in terms of understanding how your story's working. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. sorry, Karen. So, I know, and I think, f um, just in terms of my st how we develop our storytelling, for me, that that's absolutely key. And then I think that when you're looking at the kind of curated, it's it's a lot less about the discovery, it's all there for you and you kind of, everything is, is about kind of trending. I mean, it's, it's the same for, for other stuff, but I think that there's a, I like the democracy 
of the free. And I think things can just spike without anybody having anybody realising it. And I think for me it's slightly different because I live in a very sort of ephemeral world of it being very, sh very short form. Um, and then that kind of, we've developed it out. But I think that um, for MTV it's particularly interesting they don't pay for content. I mean, it's different. It's much younger audiences, and I think there's a difference there. They get they use their parents' accounts, yeah. you know, and I think that's kind of where we look to make sure that we're appearing on places where we know they're definitely going to be all the time. Is is that your experience in India? Uh, or not? I think it depends mostly on the ambition of uh, I think the content brand. I think uh, when we started, we wanted to be known fast, so we had to depend on all the free media. Mm. Uh, the way I see it, I've uh, always thought of YouTube as a Walmart of content. So you know, even if you're a small individual manufacturer, you can still be given a one square feet by one square feet space and you will just showcase it there. And I think only when you grow bigger and you realize that, okay, now you can afford your showroom, so you start opening your IKEA warehouses. So I think, I think that's, that's, that's pretty much it. For individual YouTubers, performers and stars, I think free medium is more important because their journey is to be like Seinfeld. Yeah. But then for people who want to build an NBC or the future MTV or, you know, uh, content brands, I think for them, there has to be a, a graduation to slightly more pure, premium. Are you, a pay, are you a pay platform? Are you free to air? Uh, no, we are a free platform. Yeah, yeah got yeah. that. And for our platform, is most a community play. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, what we've realized and adding to the, uh, this, uh, you know, the short form versus long form, a very good observation that we had from the fans is that, so my uncle saw Godfather in theater. My elder brother saw it on VCR, on television. I have seen it on desktop and my younger cousin watches it on iPad. Mopa. Mm -hmm. But they yeah. watch Godfather. Yeah. So I think, you know, that's, so while we try to slice and dice uh, a platform and digital yes. and semantics, but I think what we forget amidst all this confusion is that people come for great stories. And I think... Uh, Do you not think those, for us, I see that there's a, a, a whole generation of, of our audience that we're showing them content they never would have watched. So, for example, we take key shows and we take clips from it for comedy and we put it on Snapchat and they discover it the other way around. And I think that's really important yeah. and that's what we see a lot and what we're doing. I believe that a YouTube and a channel like that is a great source for us to, yeah. to uh, get to know the audience and yeah. see what they're uh, watching, but also get to know uh, new talent off screen. And I think that we need to know YouTube, we need to know the content all the time yeah. to be able to be uh, innovative and to be able to maintain what is our strength as well. Uh, I mean, I thought what you said about the audience not wanting their mums and dads to make content recommendations, it, you know, how do you think, I mean, so curation, in and of itself, sort of, is the grown-ups telling you what to what? I mean, so, so what do you think your audience's relationship to curated spaces is? Are they suspicious of them? Do they like curation? Is it all about word of mouth and shares? I think that they want to discover it themselves. Yeah. And I mean, they don't know that we sort of created this strategy yeah. for them. You didn't discover them, it. But, we you know, discovered it for yeah. you. <laughs> but yeah. I think that they, uh, for that audience, they need to, to feel that it's the, theirs. And uh, I must say uh, that it was a bit of a struggle to, to uh, make sure that we maintained the our strategy inside an arcade, but I think that's the source of the success as well, so yeah. Um, I'm terribly sorry to have to tell you all that we have run out of time. Uh, we could have talked about this for a day at least, uh, but we only got 45 minutes. Um, I hope it was useful for you guys in the audience. I learned a lot. I was fascinated, and thank you all very much for sparing your valuable time. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.